So just in the spirit of everything that's been happening this morning, I want to invite us to John chapter 11. Um, and I want to invite you to the shortest verse in all of Scripture. John chapter 11 and verse 35. That should be at least one verse in your repertoire that you've memorized. Amen. And it simply says there, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And actually, this morning, the sermon title is longer than the verse itself. But this morning, I just want us to uh, ponder the topic at the doorstep of grief. At the doorstep of, of grief. Uh, let's pray and we'll dive in. Lord, we just want to pause in your presence to give you honor and glory. Uh, that is, do your great name. And Lord, we um, are standing here with our hearts heavy and um, um, our hearts and minds filled with uh, thoughts and concerns for our brother and sister and their family um, during this time. And I just pray that you would be with Pastor Mello and Nicole and the children and uh, Elijah, the new baby, as they are um, journeying through this time, Lord, that is no doubt indeed hard and uh, difficult to go through. Um, Lord, we pray that this word would provide some balm and uh, comfort uh, for all of us who are dealing with grief and suffering and in the midst of um, painful circumstances that we indeed will find ourselves in. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Lord, I thank you that you are our rock, that you are our strength, and you are our redeemer. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen and amen. So today is uh, September 11th, 2022. It's a day that will never be forgotten in history, especially for um, nearly 3,000 people who lost loved ones on uh, two th um, September 11th, 2001, 21 years ago this day, life in America changed forever. And on that day, multiple airplanes were hijacked uh, by Islamic extremists and flown into the Twin Towers in New York City, to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and Americans everywhere were in fear of the things that were taking place. And many of us remember that day well. Remember, we remember where we were and uh, what was happening and what was going on uh, during that time. And um, the feelings that we had as a, a result. And it was a day that uh, many people asked the question, how could something like this happen? How could something like this happen? Many lives were lost, many tears were shed, and many families' lives were drastically altered in a sudden moment. Many spectators, uh, no doubt, felt the weight of that moment, and even if you didn't personally lose loved ones, you felt some deep sense of, of loss as you watched other people grieve their own loss. And while we may have felt it, none of us had the power to fix what happened. And let's just be honest, uh, we often uh, become uncomfortable around grief and those dealing with it, to the point that sometimes in our efforts to uh, comfort the person or the people uh, and, and, and fix the situation, we just end up making things worse. Some of you may have heard these uh, statements as you've uh, w gone through your own grief. Someone may say, I know just how you feel. Or, you just need to put this behind you. Maybe you've heard, everything happens for a reason. Maybe uh, someone has been bold enough to tell you to get over it. One of the most popular things we hear in these moments is, uh, even among or within the church culture, is uh, 
God will never put more on you than you can bear. And I know people have said that, but, but that, that is not the reality of what we find throughout the Scriptures. And if anything, God often allows things in our lives to overwhelm us uh, so that we become more dependent on Him. Look at what Paul says to the Corinthian believers as he describes some of the suffering he endured uh, in Asia. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, In verse 8, we don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Look what Paul says. He says, so that we would not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. And this word by Paul obliterates any, uh, any notion that God doesn't put more on us than we can bear. If anything, uh, you know, it's the exact opposite. God uh, will often put us in circumstances so that we can learn how to trust and depend on him. Uh, in the church that I grew up in, we would sing a song by Andre Crouch entitled Through It All, and it, it says... I've had many tears and sorrows, and I've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times I didn't know right from wrong, but in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come only to make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. Our passage today reveals a very grief-filled and sorrow-stricken family and, and, and how Jesus deals with those he dearly loves. And what we come away realizing as we read through John 11 is the truth that I hope you take away uh, with you today, and that is that Jesus is human enough to feel your grief and God enough to fix it. Jesus is human enough to feel your grief, and God enough to fix it. Though this is the shortest passage in all of Scripture, it provides so much depth into the humanity of the God-man and the weight of the reality of sin's effect and impact in the world that God designed. And he shows that, that he is not too distant from the suffering, but present right in the midst of the suffering, and he will ultimately suffer personally in order to reverse the curse of sin. There are many things we could um, extract out of the text, but I want to give you three things that it's okay to do when you grieve based on what we see in the passage. The first thing I want to say is that it's okay to wonder. It's okay to wonder. You can you can question this morning. You know, there's a um, a thought that uh, that that that's that's circulating throughout our culture that finds its way into the church context, and it goes something like, "You shouldn't question God. You shouldn't question God." Many people uh, feel that this statement satisfies their inability to make sense of the circumstances that often. Uh, render us wondering, why in the world did this happen? But the truth is that, that we often have a lot of questions in the middle of our suffering that we launch and hurl in God's direction. And a careful reading of the Psalms will provide the validity of this truth. David opened Psalm 13 by asking God, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? How long will my enemy dominate me? This definitely doesn't sound like someone who thinks asking God questions is wrong to do. And judging by uh, God's response. Uh, He doesn't lash out at David for asking these questions. 
And it was the 4th century African bishop, Athanasius, who is credited with saying most of the Bible speaks to us, but Psalms speaks for us. They are the emotions of the believer's uh, moments of grief and suffering. And what we learn from John's gospel this morning is that Jesus is God enough to handle your questions. He can handle all the questions that, that come his way. The truth, um, that truth ought to make someone in here really happy and joyful because the truth is many of us are going to deal with pain and suffering, trials and tribulations, and there are questions that we will want to ask. And in the circumference of our passage today, there's many questions that, that surface to the top of the page as we look at the context surrounding this scene. One of the questions that I ask is, why did Jesus stay where he was an additional two days when he found out about Lazarus' condition? Verse 1 through 6 says, Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, Mary was the one who anointed Jesus with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. And look what Jesus does. It says in verse 4, when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. It says, now when Jesus, uh, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days in place where he was. Then after that, he, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. And in and, and, and reading that, we may um, be tempted to ask the question, well, what kind of love is this? If he loved them so much, why didn't he go right away? And one thing we, we can surmise from the passage as we read it in its context is that Jesus' love for them, for Lazarus, and also his desire for his Father's glory are not mutually exclusive. And everything that Jesus does uh, he does with a purpose and a reason in mind. And we know that Jesus came to earth for a specific mission, and the reality of that mission meant that everything he did was planned out. And Jesus isn't operating on, on Mary and Martha's time schedule. Everything is calculated. Everything is pre-planned. Our, our anxiousness about our circumstances can make it seem as though Jesus is late. When in reality, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. In fact, he created time. And if anybody knows what time it is, it's Jesus. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Another question I asked as I was uh, looking and surveying the text is, why wasn't Jesus there when Lazarus needed him the most? No doubt. Right? That was the question that the sisters uh, were asking. And based on their reaction when they first see Jesus, when he finally gets there, Martha says in verse 21, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Then a few moments later in verse 32, we see Mary greet Jesus falling at his feet. Uh, and she says the exact same statement Martha did previously when she also says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Both had the same thought. If only Jesus was here, he could, he could heal our brother. He could heal our brother. They, they send the message, but Jesus doesn't show when they think he should. Have you ever been there? Something happens in your life, you find yourself in a moment of desperation, and you call on Jesus, and he seems like he's not picking up the line. 
What happens when the one who has the power to prevent bad things from happening seems like the very one who's procrastinating? Maybe you've asked God to move on your behalf or to alleviate the pain that you're in or to remove a disease or heal a friend or a loved one. Maybe uh, you've asked him to deliver you from some sort of bondage or sin, and, and it just seems like these questions are falling on deaf ears. And if we're honest, in these moments, it's hard to have faith. It's hard to have faith. And we often question um, God's ability when we're in the most desperate of circumstances. Um, and when these doubts and questions uh, come about, you know, we, we, we got to be like the father in Mark 9 who, whose uh, demon-tormented son, he, he's in a desperate situation. He brings him to Jesus. And Jesus tells the man that everything is possible to the one who believes. And the man expresses some doubt. And he says, Lord, I believe, but you got to help my unbelief. So when the doubts arise, when the questions come, we, we got to ask God to help us in those times to, to believe. One, one, one final question I had was, how could Jesus be so close and still seem so far? Verse 17 says, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Verse 18 says, Bethany was near Jerusalem. Here it is, less than two miles away. Less than two miles away. Look, you, you jog two miles, you jog five miles a day. Jesus here is less than two miles away. Sometimes, um, you know, when you're in the middle of grief, that's, that's the times when God can feel the furthest away. Right? And yet, in that moment, he is as close as he's ever been. This is why Paul reminds us that, that those of us who are in Christ, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. And when he says nothing, he means nothing. He says not death, not life, not angels, not rulers, not things present, not things to come, nor powers, um, or, or, or uh, height, nor depth, nor anything created will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, so when you feel that, 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 that God is distant, know that the feeling isn't indicative of the reality of his presence. Remember that the gospel is that sin separates us from God, but Jesus comes to bring us back into proximity uh, in the presence of God, into relationship with him. And I know I mentioned Psalms earlier and David asking questions, and one thing that is consistent throughout the Psalms, uh, and even here in this scenario, is that the person asking questions needs to maintain the ability uh, to have the right perspective that God is good and he is sovereign in all his ways, including ways that we don't understand. He's good and he's sovereign, even though the circumstance uh, is not something that we understand and we're in the middle of right now. I think one of the keys to asking questions is um, that we're asking them without making accusations against God as though he were somehow guilty of wrongdoing. Here's the thing about questions that we all need to recognize, and that is that questions are good to ask. It means that you recognize that something is wrong and, 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 or you don't understand, and as a uh, in your human desire, which is a godly one, you desire things to be made right. There's a longing for things to be made right. But in your asking, it's important that we resist the urge to, to develop some kind of, of 
of gospel or prosperity gospel or false gospel that seeks to make Christians exempt from any kind of suffering and struggle. I was talking to uh, Mello yesterday, and one of the questions that he's been asking, uh, because I asked him, I said, what are some questions that you've been asking in this season? And he says, uh, you know, we're praying fervently, and the question he's asking is, why is he not hearing? That was one of the questions that is on his mind and on his heart. You know, sometimes we can uh, develop even misconceptions about what we believe about God as we're going through these circumstances. This is evident in this passage uh, with those not really recognizing who Jesus is and what he said about himself, about him being the resurrection. They've seen him do many miracles. And it's going to be important to lay hold of the promises of God, even in the midst of pain and difficulty, uh, as you go through your trials. Author and pastor David Paul David Tripp writes in his book entitled Suffering, uh, Gospel Hope When Life Doesn't Make Sense. He says, you may consciously try to push, you may not consciously try to push your suffering through the grid of your beliefs but your cries and questions are richly theological. In other words, our questions often reveal where our beliefs are rooted in those moments. We may find that they um, um, are tested, but I pray that they would be rooted in the truth of God and lead us to trust in him, even though it's hard to do so in the middle of the suffering. But another thing in our text that we see is that it's okay to weep. You can cry. You can cry. Jesus finally shows up. It's been four days since Lazarus' death. He's less than two miles away. Um, but he waited to go see him. And now he's on the scene. And when he arrives, he's moved by this mountain of grief exhibited by the sisters and those mourning Lazarus' loss. In verse 33, we see, uh, it says, when Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come to uh, with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? This part is extremely revealing uh, for us as we see the emotion of, of Jesus um, on display as a result of what's taking place here all around him. We see Jesus actually uh, shedding tears. He's crying, and he is moved with the emotion. We may be tempted to ask the same question as those Jews and mourners that were gathered there with uh, Jesus and the sisters. Couldn't he who opened the blinded eyes also have kept this man from dying? And the answer is, yes, he could have. He could have done just that, but um, here we see Jesus moved by the moment, and I think um, he's crying for at least three reasons in the text. One, he feels compassion. He feels deep sense of love and compassion for uh, the friend that he's lost, and his friends are grieving. The mourners are there. He's moved by the emotion of the moment, and the Greek word that we, that we see that is underlying this whole idea of being deeply moved means to feel something deeply and strongly. And so as we see him cry, many of us uh, have the tendency to envision a, a single tear glistening down his cheek, uh, you know, glowing from the sun. But the reality of the context is that I believe that Jesus is visibly sobbing, runny nose weeping, moved over the loss of his uh, dearly loved friend, he weeps with those who weep. His compassion is the compassion of God, the Father, 
uh, which he shows his children. Psalms 103.13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And so Jesus is demonstrating the compassion of the loving father. But Jesus also weeps because he recognizes the full weight of sin in this moment. You see, death is a byproduct of sin that, that mankind committed against God. It was not a part of uh, God's original design when he created uh, the world. But sin impacts us more than we sometimes realize. Romans 6.23 says that it is the very reason that we experience death. And God, who is the author of life, and as a result, he gives life to all creation. But man is responsible for man's sinful condition because of the first man, Adam, who represents humanity as our federal head. He rejects and rebels against his creator's instructions. And so Paul says in Romans 5 and 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all sin. And this is Jesus moved with this emotion. He's looking with this type of righteous anger and longing for uh, the way things were before um, sin entered the equation. He sees death and he feels the weight of sin. But also we, we see he weeps as he focuses on his future suffering in a few short days from this moment, Jesus would not only weep because of the suffering of his friends, he, he would weep because of the suffering he himself would eventually enter on his own for the sin of humanity. He would experience the full measure of God's wrath to be poured out on him as he becomes our substitute and propitiation that is the payment for our sin. The reality of this future moment was no doubt also in his mind as he stands here at the doorstep of grief. We see the cross in his periphery. And praise God that Jesus willingly enters into the suffering. He pays our debt, and he clears our record. And Jesus will ultimately turn the stench of death into the fragrance of life when he resurrected from the dead. And yet he stands here overcome with emotion, present with Lazarus. Lazarus' sisters and the mourners weeping for his friend. Here's the thing, sometimes the best thing that you can give somebody who's grieving is your presence and the blessing of weeping with them as they weep. You know, you don't have to have all the right words to say. Sometimes it's good to just um, not say anything. But the fact that you're there present, weeping with them in the moment, is a big thing for people. Pastor Brian Croft offers some counsel when experiencing uh, grieving friends. He says, I'm convinced we often fail to recognize how powerfully our quiet presence may minister to someone in the first hours and days of their deep valley of sorrow. When someone you love loses someone they love, it can be a powerfully therapeutic to them to carefully close your mouth, open your ears, and perhaps even offer a tender touch if it is appropriate. As you care for those who mourn, don't be too quick to offer answers. Let them cry. Allow them the freedom to feel numb. Pray for them and pray you will speak wisely when the time is right. Let them know you care by simply being there. I think that's a good word of wisdom for us who are um, seeing friends and loved ones deal with, with circumstances and even personally dealing with circumstances with our own grief and sorrow and valleys. 
But the final thing I want to say to us this morning that it's okay to do, it's okay to wait. You can take your time. It's been said that time heals all wounds. I want to encourage those of you who are dealing with pain and grief to take your time as you grieve. Don't feel the the burden and the pressure from external sources to feel like you have to rush through the process. Allow yourself to, 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 to experience the genuine and raw emotion of what it is that you're dealing with. Notice that Jesus takes his time to get to Lazarus's tomb. And then he takes his time to feel the emotion of the moment. And then he doesn't rush to just all of a sudden resurrect Lazarus from the dead. And and what I want to say to you is that you don't have to rush past your moment either. Sometimes you just need to sit and feel and process and wait. But while you wait, I want to um, encourage you to wait in three ways. Number one, look up. Look up. Jesus doesn't allow his identity as God to interfere with his ability to identify with the grief of humanity. After all, he is the God-man. He enters into our world. He's fully God and fully human, and he feels what we feel, all so that he can say, I get what you're going through. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the benefit and the joy that we have as believers in Jesus is that our God is a God who understands what we go through. He did not sit idly by uh, in the comfortable, uh, palatial uh, state of glory while we are down here suffering and and going through all it is that comes with living on this planet, planet death, as one pastor friend says. He entered into it, and he felt it by taking it upon himself. But then also look out. Understand that your grief isn't merely about you um, necessarily getting out of the grief, but God is doing something in you while you're in it. Ultimately, he's going to use it as a testimony. The test will be a testimony for others who are going through their own grief. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, Verse 3 through 7, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction. Through the comfort we ourselves receive from God, for just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because you know that as you share in the sufferings, so you will also share in the comfort. Paul is not saying ignore the comfort, ignore the situation. He's saying the situation is there so that it may uh, uh, produce something in you that can be able to help someone else. God is not going to allow you to go through a circumstance and a situation that is going to be wasted. All of it, as much as it's difficult to understand, is for a purpose. And finally, look forward. Know that one day we will be with God in the new heaven and the new earth when Jesus returns. And all our pain, 
and suffering will all be over, and we will dwell with God, and he's going to dwell with us. Revelation 21, 3 through 5 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. And they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and, praise God, they're true. As we close today, I wanted us to um, use as a um, time of reflection, um, you know, obviously, like I said, to start, our hearts are with uh, Pastor Mello and Nicole this morning as the family is dealing with Uh, their situation. We're going to invite uh, Renee up, and she's going to share some updates about uh, the family's situation um, that we can then um, reflect and pray together uh, as we close this morning. Amen.